Well, thanks for doing this. This is uh, this is great that we're uh, able to speak to you like a month before Samurai Cop 2 comes out. Absolutely, yeah. I didn't know if this was going to be easier if I called you or you called me. Oh, I'm happy to make it as easy as possible for you because, I mean, you've been doing loads of interviews at the moment, haven't you? Well, yeah, just, you know, here and there, follow-ups, people wanting to <laughs> catch up and find out where we ended up here. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, from our point of view, it was um, in 2013, I screened Samurai Cop at um, the Bristol Bad Film Club. And I introduced the film and I had to tell the audience that you were actually dead. Right. Because that's what the internet told us. The internet told us that you had died and that you were no longer around and you had starred in the Samurai Cop and it was your legacy. And then you had disappeared. And then that all changed when you or, as I read, your daughter posted that video online of you alive and well. So how did that come about? That was um, basically me. I, I've, I've said uh, previously, I kind of kept uh, an eye on Samurai Cop uh, from a distance on IMDb, just reading the comments because I just thought they were hilarious. And um, she just kind of kept nudging me saying, Dad, you should let them know because they think that you're dead, this other guy with your name. And uh, I just, I always wanted to kind of set the record straight. There were so many rumors out there and i thought maybe i should post like four or five videos and answer certain questions on youtube i go i don't know how to do that she knew all that tech stuff and uh, she said well just you know someday when you want to set time aside just put something together so i had set up my little camera in the kitchen where i am at and did like a little test you know uh thing and sent it to her and i said is this kind of the intro you'd want me to do and then she just thought i would never do it so she put it out there um, for everybody to see with me with my shirt off looking like a goofball, but, um, and you know, I was upset at first, but then I, after all the emails and everything started pouring in, I guess, cause my IMDB or I guess that YouTube account she opened for me was attached to my emails and then my phone on my iPhone was just blown up with three, 400 emails coming in, you know, which is people comments, Oh my God, I'm a big fan. I'm from, you know, this country, that country. And so I kind of lightened up on her, and then the whole journey took off. <laughs> so were you aware that Samurai Cop had such a mass cult appeal? Because I think at the time you came back from the dead like a B-movie Jesus, there were already plans for Samurai Cop 2 to go ahead. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of really exploded over the past few years, but were you remotely aware of that? Or, I mean, was your daughter aware? No, neither of us to the degree that, that we found out later, um, but we just thought it was just one of those films that was out there that was, you know, so bad that, that it's good, you know, people that love that genre and that type of film. Um, so, but never did we imagine it was as big as it was. I had ordered on Amazon the um, digital remastered um, version that Greg Hatanaka, the current director of our sequel, had put out there and um, saw the interviews that were on there with Robert Zadar and Peter Pallion, the cinematographer. Mm. And then I kind of found out that there was a screening a year ago that Mark Frazier came and went into town to go, you know, and appear at, I think it was in November of last year. Um, and so, yeah, I had no idea. And then it was interesting to see um, after, you know, all this started coming to fruition that how many people really, like, like you had said, Greg did want to do a sequel with Mark, and they thought since I was dead, it would be Samurai Cop's daughter. We're hunting down with Frank Washington, whoever killed, you know, the Samurai Cop. But then once I came back, Greg just flipped out. and He's like, no, nope, we got to do it now. And, and that's why all of this, I don't think, and we've talked about it in some meetings, that the timing couldn't have been any better. I, of course, would have loved to have waited a year and developed a story and blah, blah, blah. But mm. like Greg said, we had to capitalize on the momentum of you coming back. Um, and, and all the, you know, fan attention and so on. And then the Kickstarter, it's just amazing to be where we are at with a movie in a theater 10 months later. Um, that in and of itself is a miracle. And the other thing is that most Kickstarters never get, they get funded, but they never get made. So, and I didn't know that. Greg had said half the time they never get made. So that was another thing that well, I was glad that we could do for the fans. But I never did I think that it was going to be as difficult to make. Uh, I just thought it was going to be a fun little goofy follow-up for the fans, but it just turned out to be, you know, a very stressful uh, shoot for at least Greg, I think, as the producer-director wearing so many hats and having so much pressure on him to get this done. Oh, well, I mean, 
it's it's been incredible. I mean, just how it's all kind of snowballed so quickly in that the film was re-released. I mean, we showed a remastered copy of Samurai Cop and, you know, it, it seemed like at that point everyone had suddenly rediscovered it almost simultaneously and the fact that they were making a sequel and then you came back from the dead, it was like a perfect storm of right <laughs> of everything happening all at once so i mean it's great um i've got so many questions to ask you about samurai cop and samurai cop 2 but i actually wanted to ask you some questions at the beginning of your career i, I listened to the interviews that you did with um 80s picture house who we uh we liaise with quite a lot and also the uh, video interview you did with red letter media who we're yes. big fans of um I really wanted to ask you about your time kind of working as a bodyguard with Sylvester Stallone. Because yeah. from your interviews I've read, you were really into bodybuilding back then. And while you're still in amazing shape, the pictures I've seen of you back then, you you were a much bigger man. Uh, what Were you into bodybuilding back then? Or was it that part of the body um, being part of a bodyguard for Stallone? I basic I, I actually got into weight training. I never considered myself a bodybuilder just because they really get into, you know, the, the training and, and the competitions and so on. I had an older brother, uh, my older brother, Michael, who worked out and then me being the third of four boys uh, in our family, uh, looked up to him and thought, hey, I, you know, it's just high school is getting out. Maybe I'll start hitting the gym. And I was skinny, probably graduated 6'3", 178. So I basically just went to the gym to work out to um you know just to emulate my brother also i was a huge fan of sly and you know watched all the rocky movies and you know just like everybody else around the you know the early 80s we were all into fitness and going to the gyms and working out and then it just became a number game for me hey now you know let me see if i can get to 200 pounds and then it was oh let me see if i get up to 220 240 and then i just kept lifting and kept eating and eating and my biggest thing has always been just i just had loved to eat back then <laughs> and i and i never got into uh steroids or hgh even now at age 51 i just never thankfully um had to deal with trying to put on weight it was very easy for me to get on and put on weight so when i left oregon and came to california and had a friend that was going to help me you know get into bodyguarding uh I was at 270, probably the highest I'd ever been, and wow. um, then I did meet, you know, Sly through the gym where I trained, and, um, but I, 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 I think I filmed the movie, I actually cut up a little bit, and I think the original Samurai Cop, I weighed 235, hmm. and um, now, uh, when I filmed this movie, I think it was 172 <laughs> or something, but I mean, I have very, very low body fat, I'm probably like 4% body fat, which is unheard of, I sustained that and have sustained that for the last four years. Whether or not that's healthy, you know, I don't know. I constantly go in and have at the California Health uh, Institute here in, in uh, California that the owner of Dole yeah. uh, has. I go in there and do the bod pods and I check my heart and cholesterol, you know, everything. So I'm, I'm healthy, but yeah, extremely lean. And I never really tried to um, bulk up even for the sequel. I know my whole Expendables uh, fellow actors all, <laughs> you know, kind of, get into that but i just felt you know and i i just have always had a swimmer's physique i'm six foot three so mm. but never really into bodybuilding but very very strict eating and uh just a constant exercise i go uh, four times a week and have for the last 30 days just basic weight training and then i walk a 6k every day just for you know relaxation and meditation which is you know six miles just just over six miles it's like you stayed in shape deliberately so you could slip back on the black banana hammock <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. That was one of my jokes. Somebody <laughs> wanted to make a sequel a little that I know those words would come back to haunt me pretty quick. But uh, no, I just, that was just my own thing. I just wanted to stay in shape. And then as I got past 40, it's just so much harder to, to lose weight. And then I've just been really disciplined in diet. So I've just maintained right where I'm at. And I think even in this one, people just think, oh, he looks kind of thin. But um, I just, you know, I, I wasn't trying to be an action star or anything like that. I was just Matt Caritas working. Never thought I'd be back in movies again. So how did you get into acting from uh, being a bodyguard? Was that something you, you picked up from hanging out with Stallone, or was it always on your radar? Because I know you, were, you also did stand-up comedy for a while. Yeah, yeah. I left Oregon, Portland, Oregon, where I grew up. I had done uh, theater all through high school and then hit all the local, you know, the Portland Civic Theater doing, you know, 
uh, skits and things there. But when I ballooned up to the 270 pound uh, category, I, I really did want to come to Hollywood and try to be like I had said in previous interviews, like John Candy. I wanted to be a big, funny guy because I've always been the class clown and entertainment was always my goal to be an actor. And coming to California, I just knew I'd be a little too big and clumsy to wait tables. So security was an obvious option. But little did I know I would work for the biggest you know, superstar in the world or actor at that time. Mm. So that was a bonus for me as an actor going, oh, my God, here you are working for the legend and also, you know, trying to pursue your own career. Uh, but it just kind of gets hard because in Sly's world, you really become... Uh, that's a very rarefied air. They're very wealthy and, and you get intoxicating and you start hanging around Sly. And, you know, at that time we, we just finished Rambo three and then it was into Tango and Cash and Oscar and Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Yeah. Lock up and, and being around Kurt Russell, Goldie Hawn and seeing all the celebrities at that time, you know, hanging out with Sly. It's just like eventually I thought, you know what, I, I want to try to get at least one percent or one tenth the fame or success that he had so i tended to break away and, and just thank sly for the opportunity working for him and then i just started doing my own stand-up comedy and the only reason i went into that was because as an actor i was uh two and everyone says two what i said i was either too tall too big you know too your hair's too long your teeth are too white you're this that the where stand-up, it's your own world. You create, write, direct, produce your skits, and you go up, and it's just a one-on-one -on -one connection with the audience with no critique in between. It's just either you're good and you're funny and you did your job, and there's nobody deciding whether or not you're worthy to go up and be entertaining. So that's that's kind of where I ended up just staying and then working nine-to-five jobs and, and raising my daughters. So when you decided to get into acting... I mean, was it Matt Hannon first, or was it always Matt Caridas, which was your stage name, or what made yeah, you my, change your my name? My birth name was uh, Hannon, Matthew Hannon, and I changed that in 94, I believe, to Caridas. And out here in Hollywood, it's kind of a, they're clicky little tribes, so, you know, they have the the Jewish tribe, the Armenian tribe, the Greeks, and so on, and, you know, Jennifer Aniston and, and uh, Rita Wilson, who was a, a, an acquaintance that I had met through Sly and Tom Hanks and so on, and they went to the Greek Orthodox Church, and I just felt I looked a little bit more ethnic with the dark hair and, and, and so on, so I thought, uh, you know, let me make up a name, and then I just came up with uh, Caritas and then changed it legally in, uh, a lot of people said, did you change your name because of the first movie, <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> it wasn't that extreme, I went into hiding, but... Uh, but that's basically all it was. I just, uh, ego, of course, you know, my father's like, what do you mean? You got a problem with our family name? And um, that's just the fan, the narcissist just wanting to set his own little trail. And, and so that's basically the simple answer of, of where Caritas came from. But yeah, the birth name was Hannon. And, and that's when we had filmed Samurai Cop. That was my legal name. So speaking of Samurai Cop, how, how did that come about? How did you meet Amir Shavan? How did you get cast in the role? Was he looking for you know, someone who looked like Sly Stallone, because back in the early 90s, and even now, you still look very similar to Sly, so I was wondering whether that was something he was looking for, or whether he was just looking for, you know, the next action star. I, th I think Amir just, uh, he, he, and if you look at the casting in his first movie, there's so many, there's such an array of different looks, and, and he was into that, but I think... Um, how I got introduced to him was the other uh, bodyguard that I worked with, Foyo Gorick, uh, with Sly, had done a film with Amir, just did a small part one day, and he said, you should go see this guy. He makes low-budget independent movies, and it's a good place for you to start and get some footage. So I just happened in and walked in, and, and for whatever reason, Amir just thought, nope, this is perfect. You're exactly what I'm looking for. I don't know if he had met Mark yet, Frazier, to play Frank Washington, but he was looking on that lethal weapon type of thing. And he just figured, yeah, long hair, um, you know, good shape. I guess he just thought the All-American leading man. Uh, some of the other movies he did, Hollywood Cop and, and mm. uh, Gypsy and those, I think he uh, uh, he tended to just look for for that type to play the, the leading role. Uh, clearly, I wasn't ready for that much with my skill. I thought I was at the time thinking, oh, yes, I'm ready, but. Looking back, you know, the, the it just it should have been, and I guess that's fine. It was a learning experience, but to have it become what it became is is just amazing. Um, because it should have just been a little, 
apprenticeship as far as an actor trying out, seeing if he can be a leading man, getting a little bit of footage, and then taking that tape and trying to parlay it into something bigger and bigger, and trying to head into mainstream, either television or, or filming. So when you got the script for Samurai Cop, what were your initial thoughts? I mean, Amir Shaban, for those that might not be aware, was from Iran, and he had, let's just say, a very specific way of how he saw American films. So did that come across in the script when you were reading it? Were you kind of like, what the hell is this? Yeah, there was uh, a lot of his phrasing was off uh, or just kind of didn't make sense. But I, I could get the gist of what he was wanting. Like some of it was kind of basic, like, you know, hey, you come here or, you know, just kind of basic uh, writing techniques. And, and I had mentioned a couple things and said, do you mind if I change some things? Because it, it, I think I can maybe do it a little bit more believable. And, and it was a fine line you treaded there with, with Amir with suggesting things because... He really, I mean, he wrote it, so he thought, no, this is perfect. This is the way it should be said. And, but, uh, yeah, and initially when I did read it, I just thought, oh, this is a good little action movie. It looks like there'll be a lot of, um, you know, car chases and fight scenes and so on, and so I can do all this. But, of course, what was on that page didn't really end up on screen um, due to just lack of funding. Amir obviously couldn't put what was on the page on screen, so he improvised a lot of that, that film, as you saw. At what point during filming did you realize that maybe the budget and the skills weren't here for Amir's vision? I mean, I like to think it's probably during the scene where you and Mark have to put out the flaming stuntman yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you're both there with a fire blanket and extinguisher, just kind of clearly winging it and not knowing, you know, exactly what you're doing. Was it? Was it kind of like that every day, Amir coming up to you going, by the way, you guys are going to have to put this guy out? Or at what point did you realize that maybe this wasn't the major Hollywood production you thought it might be? Um, I would say maybe a week a week into it, um, we just kind of knew that it was, it was getting a little, you know, he couldn't afford the crew. He was pretty heavy the first week and then he just couldn't afford the lighting or the sound guy or this or that. Um, that fire scene was probably mid shoot. And by then we already knew, you know, who knows what's coming today. And that's why Mark and I went to the set every day and had fun, but I didn't really think much of it when the, when the stunt guy was there and lathering himself up in the, the fire retardant, um, I assumed he knew what he was doing. Um, I not knowing, even though I was on sets with Sly and that's an extreme professional level, there was always safety and this and that around but i didn't even think of it there i just figured <laughs> the guy must know what he's doing he's putting this on and we're gonna light him on fire and then we'll just put him out with this tiny tiny fire extinguisher which as you can see in that shot it doesn't really put him out we had to kind of smother the flames but i don't know i think maybe in hindsight after we were all done mark i guess was completely freaked out that day but it just didn't hit me that much i just I guess I was caught up in that crazy world of a mirror and just thinking everything is normal and, you know, Alice in Wonderland and this is all what it's supposed to be and not really stepping back and going, wait a minute, man, what if this guy doesn't go out? What if he starts burning, you know, but it just didn't really click at that time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the production values is one of the things that's most famous about Amir's film. So he generally shoots it the same locations there's that farmhouse that i think is also in hollywood cop and also in um samurai cop and also uh what's the other one with robert zadar i think young rebels and yeah. um uh another one he did at that ranch ours we didn't uh we went up to a different ranch but i think that one that they filmed the home where there was a hostage and all that it was either young rebels or uh, there's another one, um, but that was done in Riverside at one of Amir's friends. He used mm. a lot of his friend's locations and homes and um, just, you know, obviously for production costs. He didn't have to have permits and he could just film and nobody would say, hey, you know, what are you doing? Exactly. So, uh, I mean, famously, you had uh, the, the film ended and you left, um, obviously, to go get another job and you got your hair cut and then yes. Amir came back. <laughs> Uh, wanting to do more shoots. Killing American Style, that's the film I was thinking of. Yes, that's the other one. Yeah. That's where it's also shot at the ranch. And um, Amir made you wear the infamous wig. So yeah. can you tell us how that came about? I mean, your reaction? and Because in the scenes where you're face on <laughs> doing one shots with the wig, you are clearly pissed off about being yeah. there. 
Uh, what was that, that was, like? Yeah, that was, like I said before, kind of immature. I mean, I don't know. I was just, I, I really wanted to do a good job, A, for myself as an actor so I could get some really good tape. That kind of fell short three, four weeks in. We realized, mm, maybe this won't even get out. Um, and then we started goofing around, which was disrespectful. But we, we started June of 90, finished the principal photography probably August couple months off and Amir said hey come back I got some reshoots we shot those in November and filled in whatever we thought that he needed and then he said all right that's it we're done and the next time I'll talk to you I should have the footage or at least the tape so you can you know use it for acting and so on and then January he called and he said could you come to the office and I thought oh great so I had cut my hair in December my agent said let's you know you've done the long hair look let's cut it short and shoot some new headshots and so on so when I went back to his office, I'm not thinking anything. And then just the minute I walked in, his face just went white. He's like, oh, what have you done? And I, I'm like, what, 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 what do you mean? And he just said, I have some more to film. And I said, you're kidding. You told me we were done. And I was kind of, I was, I felt bad for him, but I was also like, you know, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong, but now I'm thinking, you know, how's he going to finish the film? And he just said, nope, we're just going to go have to get a wig and shoot it and at that time i thought all right i guess that should be fine because i had no idea that he was gonna shoot as much as he did i thought it was going to be from a distance and you wouldn't really be able to tell and so on so i didn't really care when he was picking wigs out we're in the wig shop up on hollywood boulevard i'm just sitting there like yeah whatever if you think this looks good um but yeah you you see so much footage with that wig on and so many close-ups and um, but the scenes in the office, um, where I'm giving the monologue to Fujiyama, where I, I'm pissed off, mm. that was the second reshoot. And I just thought we were literally like an assembly line that day. Mark, they would move the camera a little to the right in Amir's office and then Mark would do his lines and then back to me. And I was talking to a couch or to a lamp and, um, I just, um, which I don't know. I, I think I knew it wasn't going to match, but that's not my responsibility. Well, how can you say that? Job. It matches perfectly. Well, I, I, <laughs> I just should have done my lines and done the best that I could and not be concerned. But that's me, the control freak, uh, t you know, worrying about things that I shouldn't be. But yeah, I mean, that was just a deadpan, you know, let me just do this. Uh, but the, the, the wig shots, um, I, I, I didn't even care. I guess I just filmed them and didn't realize in the end how ridiculous they would be in the fight scenes. I just thought, well, this is crazy. Not only was the season had changed in the fight scenes with Gerald and I, where I knew, well, we shot this in the summer. Now we're doing some more footage. How's this going to match? There's no leaves on the trees. I wasn't even thinking about the wig. Well, the location and I also didn't changed. It didn't come off until people had mentioned that. And I, yeah. thought, I, I didn't notice that. Yeah, I mean, not only did the wig fall off during the fight scene, but the location changes because you chase Gerald out into a garden, and then suddenly you're fighting in a desert. Uh, it's it's amazing. But speaking about how you um, you were frustrated with doing you know doing your speeches out of context, I can only imagine what it must have been like for Mark when he's got to give the reaction shots to to dialogue that he hasn't heard yet. Like he's got to laugh or he's got to look surprised at you flirting with the nurse. I can only assume that his shots were shot again, completely out of context. Well, he did those that day at that uh, urgent care, especially the nurse scenes. Um, those, those looks that Mark gave were at that location, but they were, um, and it's almost like an afterthought for Amir. He just thought, you know what? I, I need some intercutting reactions. So Mark, come here and stand and then he would just tell him you know look surprised uh, <laughs> look confused laugh you know and mark <laughs> would he would just do it and then i'm off camera laughing because i just know how ridiculous this is for him too i never had to do as many reaction shots but that's what i think most of amir's uh, reshoots were about where he just thought i need some things to insert and close-ups and this and that and that's where things just start to get really jumbled and again it is a very Low budget filmmaking, and that's what these filmmakers do. Even Greg Hatanaka on this sequel. I just feel so bad for people that if you do not have the money to put what's on the page to the screen and you end up daily compromising your artistic integrity just to finish a film, mm. you that's where it's very hard. And but they're so driven. Greg Hatanaka was just as driven as was Amir. That's why I've said I've noticed so many parallels, different movies. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
different circumstances, maybe a little bit bigger budget, but almost a mirror image of the same problems that come up where production wise and after everybody sees this and they're going <clears> to <throat> love it and enjoy it because they're samurai cop fans they are going to love this sequel but they will again be able to say oh my god it's almost like the same things here they maybe couldn't afford to to go back and shoot at the same sound stage you were at so they just happened to greg would film that pickup shot somewhere else so i think people it's like the Hide and go seek game of filmmaking again, where they're going to go. Oh my God, this is just unintentionally the same things start to happen because you cannot, as a filmmaker, if you don't have the money, you don't quit. You never give up. Greg Katanaka was driven to finish this film on time and have it in the theater here, and you know, in less than or almost thirty days from now. That's a lot of pressure, yeah. and you know, he didn't throw in the towel just like Amir did. I think they just wanted to make films, but. With such limited funding, it's so tough. And we had a ton of people that donated time, equipment, and so on and so forth. I mean, the movie really looks like a million-plus budget was spent on it. So that's kudos. That's great. But when people want to start you know, nitpicking, which I think they'll do, and that's what they love about the Samurai Cop franchise is, um, they're just going to be amazed at how many things are, are similar in this one as was in uh, Samurai Cop. Just um, skipping back to that infamous nurse scene did Amir write that or was that slightly ad lib because there are scenes where most noticeably when you're flirting with women that seem very natural and then there are ones that seem incredibly stilted such such as where you're kind of uh talking about being able to read people's eyes and um actually that the chicken scene where you say you've gone out and killed the chicken for dinner that, right. that, that must have been ad lib. So how much of it was kind of Amir and how much of it was you and how much did he let you get away with? The the dialogue was all Amir for the um, nurse scene. And then it was, of course, my horrible acting delivering those horrible lines. <laughs> um, but that's why. And I remember auditioning with that girl in Amir's office saying these lines. And it was so ridiculous, you know, but, uh, you know, we were just, <laughs> I guess, happy to have roles as actors and we just didn't care but uh i don't even know if if even if amir said stick to the dialogue as, I, as i'd written it i don't know if i would have performed it any differently because i was trying to do it like really is this what we're gonna say all right let's just do it um but yeah the chicken scene was ad lib i made that up which is ridiculous amir just said come up with something here that you guys would talk before you go off to the bedroom and or, you know, go swimming or whatever. So, yeah, that one was made up, which was horrible. That was the only line I had ad lib besides the um, mark coming underneath the fence when I said, why did you come under? Yeah. And then he said, because I'm an undercover cop. Just because Mark didn't want to climb over the fence. He's just like, I can't get over that. And then he said, I, could, I think I could slide under. So I said, all right, then I'll say something because it would be weird if I climb over and you don't. So let's just make this funny and we'll, we'll improvise that. But, yeah, most of it was just written dialogue that, that had mirror had and and we just had to say the lines even in the office with the girl with the lion head all those lines yeah um, oh god the, the lion's head was, yeah when i pick her up after church um every, all that was just written in the script and then delivered poorly by me as the actor <laughs> did you know that you would be essentially fighting for screen time with that lion's head at some point because no we, we didn't even notice it what i mean, I, I, I didn't you know what i mean because i never saw through Peter Pally and the cinematographer's camera, I just knew where I was supposed to be, and then all we were worried about were our lines, but I never really, even when I watched the, the tape that Amir eventually gave me with the time code, I didn't really think anything of that lion being there. And <laughs> that's just me being a naive actor, only looking at me, whereas you have film, you know, film buffs that are looking at everything and noticing everything, you know, then it becomes hilarious. And it's like, yeah, that is kind of crazy that he framed it like that. And film students pick up on that, you know, but I was just looking at me that, you know, the vain actor, oh, how do I look in the scene? And oh my God, that was terrible dialogue. And so it's crazy. Cut forward to the end of the shoot. You've been wearing, you know, speedos for love scenes. You've been <laughs> act. you've been doing the world's slowest car chase. You've been, fighting Robert Zadar. What is your first reaction when you finally see the finished film? Um, or or how, I, was there a premiere? I, how, how did it happen? I just, um, when he did give me that time-coded copy, and I think it was February of 91, maybe March, 
I just looked at it and thought, all right, now let me just pick out the best scenes for me. I just knew overall the movie was was just, um, I, it just was corny and just I didn't think it would work. But it's hard for me to, to be judgmental about a film, even like in Samurai Cop 2. I, I have to remove myself because I'm only looking at what my intentions were and even Mark's when we came back. Just You're just kind of looking at it as an actor, and I just think on that film, I just took little scenes where I thought, all right, well, this is a pretty good fight scene. I guess I'll cut that. I'll use this. I'll use that. But overall, I just knew that it was a terrible film, and I just thought, yeah, I hope nobody ever sees this. This is ridiculous. Or it'll be one of those skeleton in the closets. When you go on and do great work and you're a successful actor, then it's fun to look back. But if that's all you're going to be judged from, it's like, oh, wow. And that's what it turned out for me because I didn't do anything after that. And then this thing come, comes back to life. And here I am 25 years later and guys are like, that's what you did as an actor. No wonder you quit or, you know, <laughs> so you have to listen to all that. It must have been so great that, fun. That's with... why I was looking forward to doing this sequel and, and, and doing a much better job. Like Mark and I were thinking, great, at least we can redeem ourselves and say, look, if we could add some good dialogue and a good story, we'll do great work. But what we came up upon on this one also is that, um, you still have to follow the director's vision. Um, yeah. There was a lot of things that I did in the first movie where Greg would say, do like your character did, growl more, or make those crazy eyes. Now, that's exactly what Matthew Caritas doesn't want to do in the sequel because it was horrible acting, and there was no character in the first movie. That was Matt Hannon, shitty actor with you know crappy dialogue and so on. So I just thought... I don't want to do that again, but then you have to separate yourself and do what he wants, the director, mm. because this is a movie for the fans and this is about Samurai Cop and maybe that's, he thinks, this is what they're expecting you to do. So that's where it's tough for me, Matthew Caritas, the control freak, to to let that go and, and do that. So I, Mark and I both dip in and out of good acting that we think, hey, that was great scenes, we did great here today. And then it's like, Mark, make a goofy face. Or, and it's like, oh, really? Do I have to? Yeah, because that's Samurai Cop. So that's where I think the fans will come and they'll judge. Yeah. But it would be nice to be able to just do a movie from start to finish that's an action movie and you just stay in character, you stay on one tone, one D, you know, just do everything the best that you can do and not concede to um, somebody else's vision of, hey, Matt, now act really crazy here and laugh or do this. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know if I would do that. I think Joe's more like this, and that's where I get more thespianish, <laughs> you know. But that's the toughest thing that's been for this sequel. But that's kind of what was going on on, on the first one um, uh, as far as just being aware and trying to do, you know, the best you can do. But uh, the only footage that I could really take from that first one, which whatever scenes that I thought were good, I didn't think overall the movie itself would, would hold water. That's probably the most interesting thing I was thinking about when the sequel was announced, because just the, the tone of the sequel, because the first film is one of those so bad it's good films simply because, let's just say Amir's skill set probably didn't match up to his vision, so the... <laughs> The uh, in watching the film, it, it's it's kind of a perfect storm of his writing, the way he directed, which has made it such a cult classic. So, in terms of the tone for the sequel, you can't replicate what he did, and at the same time, you don't want to make it an overly serious film. It. What way did um you and Greg decide to go? Is it more like a a Sharknado vibe? It's very kind of wink wink to the camera, or is it a, a straight-up action film with comedic elements? How would you describe um, the tone of the sequel? The, um, well, the, the original, when Greg and I had met, it, he really did want to, and never did we have any intention of trying to do too much of the, you know, wink-winks to the first one. Because, like you said, you can't really replic replicate the hardships that Amir went through or the incompetence, and that may be too hard of a word. <laughs> I think uh, it's a fair, fair enough filmmaking. word. filmmaking. Because he, he really was trying to make a, a great film. And yeah. the the idea and the script that we came up with originally, Greg and I and Mark, was nowhere near what you're going to see. And that in of itself, I believe, will be covered in the making of and the documentary that was filmed as oh, we made this. And it, it really shows, again, what I'm saying, if you do not have the funding, you really begin to compromise 
um, the integrity. But what what I have felt, and as this movie has finished and I've seen where we're at, I, I, I just said it's amazing to me to see, and I kind of got misquoted in things, but I said, once again, I believe, and this is only my opinion, that we have accidentally recreated some of that same magic in the vein of Samurai Cop, it's so bad, it's good. Yeah. Unintentionally. And and that's what was so amazing when we got done to look at it and just go, oh, my God. And there's so many things that Greg will have to speak on. I could speak for days about it, but I don't know if it's my place to explain why certain things ended up. And, and after people watch it and they're going to love it and enjoy 96 minutes of entertainment, but they're going to say and scratch their head going, but what was this? And why was this? And what about this? And blah, blah, blah. And that's what's going to make it fun for the fans. Um, and it's just, it's just, um, I just really want people to know that there was never any intention for Greg to, uh, if they believe that, that things don't connect or they don't make sense or there's things here, it wasn't done intentionally. You will see some things that were intentional and, and, and I think they were placed meticulously and not too much, but, um, Again, with the things that he ran up against uh, as a producer with that clock ticking and, um, you know, like I said, you're dealing with maybe cast crew issues um, that, that maybe you didn't get in the scenes that you thought you could get in in that day's shooting. I think we did 22 days of principal, principal photography. That's a very short shoot. Extremely short, and I mean, typically we needed 45 days. So, again, anything that we get done that's up there on the screen... Uh, I think people are going to, and it, it's mostly like we should revisit this after the fact because I could sit here and talk about it, but mm. the performances of Tommy Wiseau and Bai Ling and, uh, you know, uh, Mark Fraser again, Caden Cross, such amazing performances. And I think Greg, when he cast this and when he wrote the script and started changing it multiple times during filming, you know, Lexi Bell has her fan base, Caden Cross. He really peppered this movie with a lot of ensemble talent, mm. uh, some of which were from the B, uh, you know, like Mel Novak, yeah. who I wasn't familiar with, but, you know, he, he all these iconic, because Greg is a connoisseur of films, and, um, you know, Mark and I, it was always a buddy movie with, uh, with him and I, but this movie got peppered with so many cameos. Tommy Wiseau is an absolute brilliant performance. I was going to ask Tommy. about Tommy Wiseau. I, mean, I, I learned about him because, you know, we were compared with, you know, movies that were so bad that they're fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's in his own, uh, league as far as just an amazing personality. He delivers <laughs> on that screen, absolute entertainment. I mean, I'm, I'm just dying laughing. I mean, he, he really is an amazing talent and I think people are just going to love coming to watch and to see, you know, what all of us have done here in this ensemble cast. But, yeah, it really is completely different. And I told Greg, you should present to some people maybe after the fact what our original shooting script was and then what we ended up with to just see how far things can go south quickly. But uh, Greg kept it on, on point and just kept, you know, sticking and moving. And I think we changed the plot four or five times. So uh, people are misled, I think, a lot with the uh, trailer because they think it's all in space and so on. And the... the 2001 space you know so we let that go for a while as people thinking yeah really samurai cops in space <laughs> but um that just has to do with uh, stages that were available for the cost and the money that we could afford but uh visually like i said the, the filming that he did with that 6k camera the red camera it's an amazing camera uh it's probably the highest resolution out there i curse the thing because it is so sharp <laughs> um uh, every wrinkle every you know, flaw on my face just comes up. The girls look absolutely stunning and beautiful. Mark Frazier, you know, black don't crack. He's got no wrinkles. <laughs> we joke about that. And he's, you know, a little bit older than I am. But we also shot some of the film in 35 millimeter. Um, so that I love because that softens everything up. But I just think, and that's what's exciting for us. I can't wait to have everybody sit down and come that really want to see the sequel and just to hear everything that they, you know, any questions that they have and just watch them enjoy it. Because I do think it's going to be another 96 minutes of absolute entertainment, which is all we could have hoped for in the end. But it really wasn't the direction I think that we were wanting to go. It just accidentally has become what it's become. And I think it's going to be well received. Well, I'm talking to Greg at the moment about hopefully hosting a special double bill here in the UK. Um, maybe getting the premiere, hopefully, if... Uh, 
if all goes to plan. But in terms of working with Tommy Wiseau, I mean, the man's not so much in his own league, but, you know, on his own planet. He's a, he is a definite fan favourite. I mean, we show the room here annually, and it's always sold out. Everyone loves uh, <laughs> Tommy. I mean, what was it like just working with him? I mean, from what I've read, from what I've seen, I've met him personally before. He is a law unto himself. So, I mean, what was it like sharing scenes with him? It was, um, it was amazing. I remember we had met first. I think Greg was, um, the contact that he had, I think the, the girl that makes his DVDs for his movies, because Greg does distribution of other films besides just the Samurai thing. And she knew Tommy because she also made his DVDs. And okay. so they got hooked up and Greg just thought, oh my God, it would be an amazing get if we could get Tommy to do this and I remember he came and met us and we all had dinner and we talked and and, and uh you know Tommy has very strong opinions about movie making and filmmaking and, oh god gotcha. yeah uh, he, he was kind of you know not sure if he wanted to get involved and you know I mean I think one time he made the comment where you know it's fine but in the end I must kill the samurai and we're like absolutely a samurai cop must die that makes complete sense <laughs> um, you know so we just we go along and it was fun to hear his points of view and then uh but yeah, to work with him was, uh, we had fight scenes that we do together and, and I keep joking saying it's like, uh, you know, De Niro and Pacino meeting in heat for the first time, these two <laughs> icons of the cult world coming together on screen. And I think the fans will love what they see, but yeah, just very, very professional. Um, you'll just see his performance is absolutely entertaining. He was well worth having a, having him on board and we were so glad to have him come and, and, uh, you know, be a part of this. I can't wait. What was it like reuniting with the rest of the cast, many of whom I assume must have thought you were dead? I mean, Mark Frazier, what was it like seeing him again and and your female cast members from the first film and, and everyone, I guess? Yeah, Mark I had spoke with immediately after um, I talked with Greg when I met with him when the video came out. And Greg said, I got to meet you. And he came to my place out in Calabasas and we, we had a lunch and, and so on. I said, let me have Mark's number. I mean, because I hadn't talked to Mark in 20 years. Yeah. And uh, I, so I called, hey, Mark, it's Matt. And he's like, hey, man, how you doing? And what I understood from that tone was, again, he was getting ready to be the star of this sequel, and he still is the star with me. With, I always have said we co co-starred this thing together because it was about a partnership. Yeah. But it wasn't like, oh my God, thank God you're alive, and it's so glad to hear your voice. It you was stole like, my movie. Yeah, that's what he said. He goes, man, you fucked up my film. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I was going to be the star. Now you coming back? I'm just your sidekick, and. And I made it real clear to Mark that that was never my intention. I didn't know, I mean, all this was going to happen the way it happened. And I, I had very specific uh, directions, even in my contract as an actor with Greg, where I stated, I am very adamant that this remain a buddy yeah. cop movie. And I want Mark and I to be together. And I said, I have no problem, you know, with same billing. I, that, none of that stuff mattered to me. It was just getting back into it. So Mark and I, when we hit the set for the first time, just right back into where we left off. Um, Melissa came out and filmed for a day. Um, uh, Melissa Moore as Peggy. Yeah, the girl returning. up in the helicopter, Peggy. Yeah, the we nymphomaniac get, um, on the police force, as we call her. Yeah, she was amazing. We couldn't get Janice um, to come back. We did locate her. She, um, her name also has changed. Okay. She not nothing to do with the movie. Um, <laughs> she just uh, felt that um, she did not want to be a part of this. I think. Um, Again, I thought she was an amazing actress in the first one, but I think because of the nudity and she has children and she's married it's fair enough. and she's in a professional world, she just didn't want that to come back. And uh, we understood that and, and, and respected her wishes. It created a huge uh, dilemma, which we'll all decide and talk about later after everybody watches the movie. But um, just because of what we did with, with Caden trying to play uh, both parts, uh, you know, flashback and, you know, being Janice. And oh, I, right. I so Caden be... Cross is Jennifer. Or... Correct. And I think you see in the trailer when you see her in the, and again, the wig has appeared again, but not on me, but on her. You'll see her in a black wig and then she's blonde. And some of that, you know, we'll see if that makes sense. There were some story changes, but it would have been amazing if we could have just had Janice come back for Oh, that's going to be things. interesting. But uh, Gerald came in originally, but then health reasons, he could not uh, film at all. His part was very large, and his doctor just thought, I think he was having some heart problems, and they oh, just no. thought, you can't risk it. 
Uh, Robert Sadara, as, as we all know, tried several times to fly out, uh, but due to weather, he couldn't make it during the two times we tried to fly him out. And then just before the third, he had uh, passed away. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Olsen came back, um, who was the, um, the, uh, one of the cops. I know people have made references on YouTube and I think when the Blu-ray came out, Jimmy is doing a scene in the police station and under his nose, people have rumored that they said it looks like Coke. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> no, what happened with that Blu-ray? It does make that movie so sharp. Jimmy had a rash or a scab under his nose and the makeup gal had put some Vaseline to try and cover it. Now, on the 35 millimeter version of the movie, you can't even tell. Even on the version before Greg remastered the DVD, you couldn't tell. But on the Blu-ray, it really stands out. You can see that. But that's basically all that was. But he came back and did a little cameo, and it was nice to see him. Uh, Cranston Kamuro, who plays Fuji, Fujiyama, Fujiyama. Uh, yeah. came back, and he is absolutely amazing. And Mark's going, man, didn't we kill all these people? How are we going to I was about to say, because Robert Zadar was killed in the first one. I mean, if he had yeah. returned, would he have been like Yamashita's twin brother? or? I don't know how Greg was going to use him. A lot of it was kept secret, and I think he just, just you know, suspended belief, and everybody was just going to... I'm sure we could go along with it, come yeah. Back, even though we know, I think in this original script, he explains why Akamura is still alive, why Fujiyama is still, you know. But at, at that one point, you just forget about it and, and just let the audience make up their own decision of why they're back. But once again, Cranston, not being an actor, came back and was just absolutely amazing in his performance. And that's what I said, I think everyone's going to enjoy. If you want to just come back and see where Mark and I are 25 years later and where Cranston and, you know, Melissa, uh, Caden Cross being new, uh, she is an amazing actress. And I know there was a big deal about all these adult industry uh, actresses that were in our movie. Yeah. Um, Lexi Bell and so on. But let me tell you, they, um, I had no knowledge of their work. And, you know, even to this day, I didn't look at them with that kind of judging eyes or what people, a lot of people have made comments, oh, this movie, I'm not going to watch it because they're in it. Caden Cross easily could work in Hollywood. She, and I think you guys will see this, is an amazing actress, period. Mm -hmm. I don't know what she's done. I don't, you know, that's fantastic that she had a career before. She is absolutely an amazing actress, and I will stand by that, and everybody when they watch the film will see that. Um, Lexi Bell, absolutely entertaining. These girls came in and did, you know, their fight training rehearsals. They took it very serious. Um, and how about uh, Bay Ling? trying to think there's another actress that, that that's also in it and her name escapes me um bailing her and i had some no no it was uh, i thought nicole bailey is her oh name. okay right. she and i had fight scenes together this girl had choreographed fight uh, knife fighting that was with our stunt coordinators and stunt teams absolutely amazing I mean, she was blowing me away i couldn't remember my moves uh, i mean <laughs> i'm the one that's going ah cut let me do it i don't remember what is it duck stab she was absolutely dedicated to what she was doing there. And that's why I just think it's amazing that these people just come forward. They were happy to be involved. Most everybody that was involved in this, uh, Joe Estevez, Charlie Seen's brother, who plays the police captain, absolute uh, pleasure to work with that type of professionalism. So, and like I said, Tommy Wiseau, uh, Mel Novak plays an absolutely uh, cuckoo character in this movie, but they all just came in, had no idea what this was all about. What is this samurai cop? The, you know, Mark and I knew because we're coming back as the veterans, but everybody else coming in just really gave 150% into this movie because they just all wanted to be a part of it. And that goes from the stunt team all the way through the hair and makeup, the crew that are obviously all working for well below their normal fees because sure. they just said, man, I just love this movie so much. I just want to be a part of it. I just want to be in the credits. And there was so much of that that was gone there. And that's why I said it's just an amazing collaboration of everybody involved. And we did put together 96 minutes of, of, of entertainment, which I think everybody's going to love. Bai Ling, actually, too, is amazing. She's, um, her and I had some great scenes. She really is just uh, visually very stunningly beautiful, as is Caden and all the girls on this. But her performances, even as an actress in this, was, was it's just amazing. So I think everyone's just going to just love coming to see all these cast of characters, Mark and I included, um, coming together, and, and this is our version of what we think the sequel would be. It's going to be great. Um, I wanted to just briefly touch on something you've mentioned in previous interviews, where you've been remarkably candid about what happened after 
Samurai Cop, where you, you know, you go on to say you spent some time in jail and, and everything. I mean, were you ever going to come back to acting? Was it merely just from your daughter posting that video that this whole acting re resurgence has happened? Did you have any... Um, I mean, has the Samurai Cop 2 thing completely derailed any plans that you had, or, or was this something you were setting out to do? No, yeah, I never really wanted to go back into acting just because I thought I would never be able to have the ability to control like I do with the stand-up. My goal was I was getting ready to just tape my own um, one-hour comedy special. Okay. And then I was just going to shop it around to HBO Showtime and, and so on, just to kind of, because, it, it, you know, at 50 years old, it's like, you know, where have this guy been? You know, what's, you know, why is he not, why have we not seen him? And I created that whole character of Brian Maccavelli. Mm. And the stand up was based on a guy that has just been paroled from prison after 25 years. Yeah. And that allowed me to introduce and people go, well, where's this guy been? Even though it's a character. And then just take the audience through a, a whole, what it's like, to, you know, what all that stuff going through prison and so on and so forth, point of view. And then it allowed you to touch base on any topic in the last 25 years because you could you know call back on it and it's not like hey that's outdated it's like no you know i you know I, I can do so much stuff there but acting i just thought i always loved and wanted to go back into it but i just thought i just don't see any way in obviously this is something that's come up now that could open doors um again it's me having to deal with uh playing that character the way greg wanted it and not yeah. doing you know, the best, so, you know what I mean? So, uh, but if somebody looks at it and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I think this guy obviously could do low budget action movies or keep doing small parts and maybe, uh, you know, I mean, everyone out there that's working now, that's still my age, people go, you know, Clooney and I mean, these guys are not even, I'm not even in their league, but I'm saying they're 50, 51, you know, Brad Pitt and so on and so on. And they're still out there. So there must be an audience to see Sly's still out there. Arnold's still out there. You know, exactly. The stars that I grew yeah. up with. So Well, Sly's planning knows? on uh, shooting Expendables for this November, I think, or so I read. So there's he always that opportunity. He's, the yeah. man is a workaholic. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I can't wait to see Samurai Cop 2. I'm talking to Greg. Uh, to hopefully get the UK premiere here. So, I mean, if you guys ever fly over, it would be great to finally catch up. We'll show you oh, Bristol, absolutely. grab some beers. It'll be great. And uh, hopefully we'll get a double bill going. So thanks yeah, really I, much I for know doing this. Everybody would be able to sit through both, but I think they could, I guess. Uh, <laughs> It'll be me and a dedicated 20. But I'm actually, we have a big um, cult film audience here in Bristol, and they absolutely love Samurai Cop. So... That's awesome. It it would be great if we could uh, do a special double bill here. So so yeah, but thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely, it was my pleasure.